namaste siddhartha ji welcome to ahimsa conversations thank you thank you, and, thank, you. And thank you so much for being here uh, what is your earliest memory of ahimsa in any form as an experience or as an ideal well uh, in college there was a, a lecturer whom uh, who was uh, very interesting and he used to you know in the evening uh, weekends we were exposed to social service and things like that and he would say above all we are human beings uh we are it's our common humanity which is fundamental and most important and he would insist we are first human beings and only then are we hindus or muslims or christians or buddhists and uh, you know that stuck uh, in my mind and uh, you know even to this day that has left a very powerful kind of mark mm. this notion mm. of our common humanity mm. where was and, this college know, uh, this was in chennai loyola college yeah. okay sorry you were saying something further yeah and uh, over the years you know as i got into understanding evolution and where human beings emerge you know i you what, today we know that uh, we we emerged in africa uh, and uh, the, there was this migration out of africa about 100 uh, 1000 years ago or so so today we are conscious of color and religion and you know and yet uh, this was our common humanity and uh, scientists today say that if you were to check your genes you would find relatives uh, all over the world you know different races and so everybody is at some level a cousin mm. you know uh, and uh, all this notion of blood puri- purity and nationality and caste is all illusory you know that this notion of common humanity Uh, is i think what this uh, professor told told us i think is fundamental yeah and yeah tell me how does this translate for you uh, as as a grown up how did this translate into the actions that you chose to undertake and where did nonviolence as an, an ideal and as a method fit into that well i was uh, also profoundly influenced by uh, gandhian notions and uh, i must say that marxism initially interested me and then i found it too logical too rational and lacking in i thought feeling and emotion and uh, and uh, you know lacking a spiritual sense uh and i found that in gandhi uh i'd see gandhi as a as a point of departure not as a point of arrival you know uh, we have to look at his significance in the modern world today uh and uh, then i think the buddha also profoundly influenced me and uh i am part of a buddhist group or i won't i won't even call it a buddhist group it's a study group which meets on uh, zoom twice a week and uh, discusses uh, aspects of buddhism right now we are doing shanti deva's uh, uh, the way of the bodhisattva yeah. uh, and uh, you know the bodhisattva as everybody knows or most people would know is somebody who is at the verge of nirvana and postpones his or her nirvana uh, till all others can also attain nirvana 
So the act of nirvana can also become a selfish, slightly selfish act, yeah, because you're just thinking of yourself. Yeah. And you see, let me postpone it and uh, work with others and help, help others. I also found uh, uh, the Buddha interesting because he states the, there is no self. The self doesn't exist. And I would interpret that to mean that the self doesn't largely exist. That we are all conditioned beings. You know, we, uh, we, the accident of our birth makes us whatever, Indian or American or uh, Kenyan or Japanese. The accident of our birth gives us a religious identity. And uh, the community we grew up with, our parents' background, the school we went to, all this conditions us. So this self that we think, you know, exists is, is not real. It's all made up, it's conditioned. And uh, so, you know, we can get uh, upset. I mean, if somebody calls me a name, or let's say, uh, you know, somebody from another religion says something about my religion, you know, I'm uh, kind of very profoundly impacted because this conditioning, it's not really me, it's this conditioning which gets affected. And uh, I think the Buddha's notion, notion that the self is a creation of causes and conditions is, uh, I think, a very, you know, very uh, deep insight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the Buddha was India's, uh, you know, I keep seeing him as India's greatest uh, secular spiritual thinker. Because among the great religions, he's the uh, religious leaders, uh, the founders of great religions. He's the only one who never talked about God, you know. Uh, and he was concerned about human dissatisfaction yeah. and how to overcome that. Yeah. Ah, ahimsa Parmo Dharma is there very much in the ancient texts of India. <clears throat> but your work, I think, has been profoundly influenced by the Buddhist concept of nonviolence. So could you... Uh, say more about how that shaped your social and political activism, both in India and through global networks? Yeah, well, uh, I think that, you know, meeting interesting people from in different parts of the world, looking at uh, interesting uh, social transformation programs, again, in different parts of the world, these have all influenced me. And uh, I have also had a side of me, which is uh, kind of literary. I've liked writing. I'm right now finishing, uh, I finished a book of short stories and I'm trying to polish them. And uh, therefore I thought that in this discussion, I could bring in what, you know, some stories that I call parables. Please and, do. Uh, you know, and talk about them. So I'll talk about the first parable, which is actually, I won't say it's very well known, but it's known in, uh, in many circles, particularly Buddhist and Hindu circles. And it's called Indra's net. There is this net of Indra's. Indra is this God and uh, the God Indra has this net in the sky. And it's a net which is, you know, enormous. And the very strands of the net, you know, where the fibers meet, the strands of the net, at each uh, knot there, there's a brilliant diamond sparkling away, you know. So you see this net and, uh, you know, the nodes of the net are these brilliant diamonds. Uh, and then, you know, you're stunned by this and... Uh, you know, each diamond is so extraordinary. And then, but when you get 
close to a diamond and you examine it closely, you realize that the brilliance of the particular diamond is the reflection of the reflection of all the other diamonds. That some of it comes from within itself, but most of it is the reflection of the reflection of all the other diamonds. So, you know, the, the Buddhist notion of interconnectedness and interdependence, that we are all interconnected with each other and interconnected with the earth because we emerged from the earth. The first, you know, I keep, uh, uh, I often talk of the story of evolution. The Big Bang happened almost, uh, let's say, 15 billion years ago. And the earth came into being about uh, 5 billion years ago. Uh, four point something, almost five billion years ago. Now, the life of the earth, this five billion years, is staggering. Five billion years is a long time. We can't always, you know, visualize it or imagine it. So let's imagine five billion years equals one year. So the earth is one year old. So at the beginning, there's nitrogen, helium, the gases, they had to cool. So in this one year of the Earth's life, uh, it took eight months for the first single-celled organism to emerge. You know, in this one year of the Earth's life, and we know that the single-celled organism became multicellular and slowly life began to emerge. And in this one year of the Earth's life, the human being emerged only 24 hours ago. So the human being is so recent, you know. And in this one year of the Earth's life, our great religions emerged only half an hour ago. So the human being is 23 and a half hours older than all the gods we have. No, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, saying this to kind of uh, undervalue our religions or our gods, but I'm, what I'm trying to say, these are all cultural products. And uh, these cultural products would be certainly based on an, a spiritual experience. You know, I, I firmly believe that we all are spiritual beings. We are not just materialist, rational beings. There is a spiritual dimension. And these spiritual dimensions in particular periods and particular cultures take particular forms. But our common humanity preceded all these gods. You know? So I come back to the notion of our common humanity preceded all our gods and our common spirituality preceded all our religions. And uh, I mean, just to finish this, uh, uh, modern science and technology in this one year of the Earth's life is only two minutes old, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's so recent. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that is Indra's net. Then the other parable I want to talk about is the parable of the ants. And uh, there was... Uh, you know, our main street, our main shopping, one of our main shopping streets in Bangalore is known as Brigade Road. It has all these window shopping, you know, shops selling various things. And young people like to walk down that street, look, you know, even if they don't buy something, it's, you feel you are somebody when you walk down that street. And it's a street which kind of you know, there's an incline, downward incline from the top of Mahatma Gandhi Road. It goes down. So there was this, there's the story of this young teenage ant walking down, you know, looking at the shop windows. You know, he wants something to grip him, something to excite him, to give meaning to his life. So he's walking down, looking at the windows. And 
you know, interested, fascinated by what he's seeing, but he needs a larger passion. Then as he's walking down Brigade Road, he hears a, a kind of chant emerging in the distance. And the chant is fascinating. You know, he can't get the words, but it, it, it has a lot of energy, almost a kind of spiritual energy. So he rushes, you know, down the road. And as he approaches, you know, uh, you know, from where the sound is coming, he sees there's a kind of pyramid there. It's, uh, it's either a pyramid or a mosque or a church or a temple, you know, something in that. You know, it, it has that kind of a image. And he runs towards that. And when he gets close enough, he sees that it's, you know, this, this uh, so-called temple or church or mosque is actually a, a, a mountain of ants. And uh, they're all screaming and jumping on each other and chanting. And this chant that he had heard, now he, it was clear to him, the chant was said, got to get to the top, got to get to the top, got to get to the top. So each ant is you know, jumping over the other, kicking, screaming, scratching to get to the top. And the story goes that one ant finally got to the top. And when he got to the top, he looked around and he said, but there's nothing here. Uh, the ant which followed, he said, okay, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so so much of today's you know modern vision is to get to the top and again you know from a buddhist perspective uh, david lloyd the buddhist philosopher in america he says uh, all human beings feel a sense of lack you know, if you, want, if you want money, you know, you try to make money, you make some of it and you're still dissatisfied. If you want power, you're dissatisfied. If you want to be a celebrity and have your picture in the papers, you know, just having it once is not enough. You're still dissatisfied. You want more of it. If you feel that sex can fulfill your, fulfill you, even that is not satisfying. You know? So there is a lack within you and your failure to deal with this lack, to find out, you know, what is it? Uh, you compensate through wanting more of all this, more power, more money, uh, you know, becoming more of a celebrity, etc. And uh, this uh, lack, if you don't address it, you, you're never fulfilled. Yeah. And this sense of lack, you know, it's, it's, it's only through reflection, uh, quiet, some quiet time, some self-understanding that you realize that these are all the wrong ways for fulfillment, you know, power, money, sex, uh, being a celebrity. And that there is something within you which you have not tapped, a resource which can be ahimsa, which can be a sisterhood and brotherhood, which can be connectedness with nature, which can be poetry, dance, music, uh, friendship. So instead of experiencing this, one is running away. And, uh, and in after power, money. And, and this is not just, it's not just an individual journey because this lack that you experience, you create problems for other people. You know, you, you exploit other people. You want more money so you don't pay proper wages to people who work with you. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, it's also you can at even... the heart it's also at the heart of the structural violence that then we are part of right right yeah and uh, all these things are not just individual they also assume a kind of collective uh, identity you know a community can feel that we want more power yeah or we want more visibility or we want more recognition you know whatever so it's both individual and collective Yeah. Did was there a third parable? Yes, there's a third parable and maybe a fourth one if we have the time. But the third parable is a par the parable of the frogs. So there's this field, uh, and it's a bright, hot day, and there are several wells there, and the, the you know the wells all have walls. and on top of the walls you are sitting different frogs you know so frogs frogs yeah huh. so some wells are orange or saffron in color some are green in color some are blue white and the frog frog sitting on each of these wells uh it was a hot day and so they you know uh, they were sitting on the walls and maybe the heat got them annoyed and irritated and the frog on the green well was saying my well is the best well the water in my well is is the purest water and the frogs on the saffron well were countering this what nonsense it's our well which has the best water you know uh it's this well which uh, is which is pure and so on the white well, the white well and the blue well you know the, all of them were saying their water was the best and that day being particularly hot they kind of shouted themselves hoarse and slowly they began to you know as the sun crept up they you know they began to feel tired and one by one they started jumping into their wells to cool off so that day being particularly hot they went deeper into their wells and some of them uh, when they went deep they found little cracks at the bottom of the well little passages and all that and they found the water there even more cooler so they went into those passages and so they cooled off and then when some of them Uh, came up you know some frogs from the green well came up in the saffron well some frogs from the saffron well came up in the green well some frogs from the blue well came up in the white well etc or the green well basically you know these passages underground passages you know there were these common waters which didn't uh, you know on the surface they looked like wells which were distinct and the waters were distinct so basically the you know the the moral of the story is the deeper you go into yourself you discover your common humanity you discover this common ground you belong to and as long as you are at the surface you discover you see the differences in color in you know in gestures or in ritual or whatever and uh, i think it's a i i often think that if we had stories like this for children in schools you know nobody would grow up feeling dogmatic you know yeah uh, and but, uh, yeah sorry but said that is our common humanity sufficient basis to inculcate ahimsa and non violence do you think or does that require some further um orientation or is the is is the implication of what you are saying that to know your common humanity is to realize that non violence is our natural self or is non violence a learned trait what has been your experience on this 
rather than you know what is the theory of it what because you have seen many different kinds of social movements you have been engaged in many kinds of social and cultural activism what is your conclusion on the basis of that when well, you know i won't say that human beings are ontologically or intrinsically non violent or you know prone to ahimsa i'll only say that the experience of sisterhood and brotherhood and non violence is a satisfying experience is a fulfilling experience you know it doesn't drive you into a corner with anger and uh, jealousy uh, you know th these are kind of uh, self -de defeating notions you know you are a lesser human being you are less fulfilled so quite apart from whether we are intrinsically drawn towards uh, you know non violence the experience of non violence non violent communication non violent behavior non violent solving of problem non violent political negotiations uh you know i i think one of the things that i've learned from gandhi is you can confront your opponent sorry you can confront your opponent mm. somebody let's say who who is whom you think is behaving unjustly you know mm -hmm. through non violent agitation or non cooperation or whatever but gandhi refused refused to see the opponent as an enemy and therefore there was i i don't think there was any hatred in him vis-a-vis -vis, you know uh, indians who opposed him or the british whom he was confronting and i think this you know this gave him this sense of you know he was a joyful human being i mean he obviously you know went through difficult times but he was he had a sense of humor he was joyful and what is life without joy without happiness without brotherhood and sisterhood you know yeah you become a very diminished human being mm. if hatred and violence and yeah. conflict is what is driving you you know can you give an example from some of the work that you have been engaged in either in india or in your uh, engagement with networks abroad that are working for peace and justice is there any specific incident or moment that comes to mind to illustrate this well you know i for example uh, here we work in some villages uh not in bangalore but a couple of 100 kilometers from here and uh, the areas we work in the panchayats have become uh corrupt you know political parties they are linked up for power and money you do find the odd panchayat member who is serious but the others are all going the wrong way and the adivasi communities are not getting what they should be getting so initially our reaction was they should protest they should expose these people uh you know and uh, so some of that happened with us and with other groups also and then i found that that hadn't really helped very much because it created a polarization so then we said why don't we talk to these guys you know they are after all human beings and they learn all this from their the big political leaders that this is the way uh, politics is conducted so we brought them into discussions you know with the adivasis and and i'm not saying all the problems were solved but at least they were open to taking their jobs more seriously opening uh, open to discussing with the adivasis what programs are available and they should actually take advantage of them of these programs so i found that this kind of dialogue 
helped in not that uh, we solved the problems or they became uh, much less corrupt or all that but certainly the certainly things improved mm. Mm. and uh, they also i think began to have a sense of empathy that having power is not just uh, about you know power and money but also relating to people yeah then at, a, at a yeah sorry go ahead then at the kind of interreligious level earlier we used to you know come together as people who believed in the constitution and secular values and i found that uh, you know whenever there was a protest or demonstration you know peaceful demonstration on mg road uh there were the same 100 people who were there each time you know i didn't find too many new people so i realized that this group of converted people had become a ghetto i mean maybe articulating the right values and the right uh, uh opinions and all that but uh, it was seen as again a polarizing kind of approach so i felt that one had to talk to people with whom one disagreed you know uh, people who you know that people from different religions would say you know our religion has been trodden upon or we have been humiliated and i didn't have the patience for that kind of talk earlier on but now i feel if they if they really feel that then they merit a li- listening you know and maybe the odd x y z might use it for use these arguments for this purpose or that purpose to gain power but there are a number of people who actually feel these things yeah we've been marginalized we've been humiliated whatever so i think it's important to not dismiss what they say but begin a process of dialogue with them with empathy yes so, with empathy so that the what i'm hearing you say is that the non violent approach essentially also is about enabling people to find their better self am i hearing yes. that yes yes yeah and yet and when we look around us do you sometimes feel that in the larger scale of things both in india and abroad many people are seeing an explosion of hate and and uh, animosity is that an illusion or uh, is that a real problem according to you well i i think uh, you know what i stated earlier this sense of lack in the modern world that has become even more Uh, prominent in traditional societies despite caste and gender disparities and all that uh, there are worlds where you know there were certain values which which were strong for them values which are perhaps most more important than money or power for a large number of people you know barring a few today uh, you see that uh, you know it's almost like in dostoevsky's novel there's this line uh, if there is no god anything is permitted so let, let, even if you not, you're not a religious person you know you can say if there's no ahimsa or if there's no uh, if there's no framework of values you know anything is permitted and we are creating a society where these lacks within us are accentuated you know power money uh, narcissism uh, all these things uh, are accentuated you know a man would look at a woman you know we are and in india i think this is very strong uh, not as a, another human being but as a sexual object you yeah. uh so when they say you have to castrate these rapists or you know 
the death penalty, I think we don't realize that it's a society which produces these people. You know, if they had grew up in families where this respect, gender respect was there, if they went to schools where it was there, they wouldn't end up like this. You know? Yeah. yeah. Zanka, and, over the years, uh, by virtue of uh, uh, running and, and, you know, facilitating the work of fireflies, you have been witness to a wide range of creative efforts in India and abroad because many people come to Fireflies to hold their events. What is your overall sense of, uh, uh, I mean, what is your projection for the near future? Are you hopeful? Uh, do you think Ahimsa has a chance or are we headed into a very dark and difficult period? Uh, my sense is, as long as you keep doing things which that are hopeful, even if they are little things, you know, there's something in just the act of doing which makes you feel energetic and positive. And uh, maybe the Western notion of hope is different from the Indian notion of hope. Okay. By the Indian notion of hope, I mean Nishkama Karma, mm -hmm. which uh, is from the Bhagavad Gita. And Gandhi was very powerfully drawn to that. You know, we, we act not because we want to see the fruits of our action, uh, but because it's right and moral to act. Mm -hmm. Action without attachment to the fruits of one's action. So who are we to know? I mean, you know, will climate change destroy the, you know, 90% of human beings in the next 50 years? Uh, or will some critical mass be achieved in the next couple of decades and something remarkable will change everything? Uh, so though the, you know, it looks dismal and the clouds look forbidding, you know, heavy and dark and forbidding, I think this notion of nishkama karma is a very helpful notion. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. who are you to kind of uh, say that, you know, I, I have to in my lifetime see, see these fruits and results. Mm -hmm. You know, you have faith and you do the right thing, you know. I have a feeling that your calling your center fireflies had something to do with that. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, uh, I call call it fireflies because fire, firefly is such a romantic, uh, you know, I, I think we need romance in our lives. And at, at night when you see it, you know, it, it's something in you awakens. But fireflies is also, there's a notion of you see it and you don't see it. So life is both the visible and the invisible. How you know? lovely. And the invisible it can be spiritual, it can be poetry, it can be music, you know, uh, it's the sound of things, words. So uh, I think uh, many of us who are in the social action world, we need more poetry in our lives. We need more of the invisible in our lives. Yeah. So uh, before closing, is there any advice that you would give to young people? that of in the same spirit of what they could do in their own life, in their own small, big way uh, that would enrich them and move the world towards Ahimsa? Well, you know, young people are quite often happy. They are playful. Uh, they can laugh. And as we grow older, we find that we can't laugh heartily. You know, I'm always amazed when I meet His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who when he laughs, his whole body shakes. You know? <laughs> and he laughs like he's a kid of, you know, whatever, uh, 10 years or 12, you know, 10 or 12. Or, and I keep wondering, where does this laughter come from? What is it, you know? He also had huge responsibility. People criticized him for not being more aggressive towards the Chinese. 
uh, all that, you know. And yet uh, he can laugh. And I once asked him and he said, you know, I wake up at three in the morning, three, three thirty, and I meditate till about seven. And then after that, I have breakfast and meet people and do my reading or, uh, you know, all that, my study. And, and uh, I realized that those few hours of quiet that he has in his life, you know, he has discovered something. He has discovered levels within himself, which uh, the ordinary human being does not discover. The ordinary human being does not give himself or herself the chance to discover those levels. So that's why he can laugh like that. So I keep thinking if young people were to realize that the biggest blessing is to be happy and joyful. And this lack that the modern world is pointing at you, this lack of power and money and being famous, will make you unhappy. Uh, some, somewhere at their level, you know, these are very powerful, you know, the, uh, whether it's the advertising world, whether it's uh, the Joneses who live next door, they're all telling you, you have to insist on your lack. You know, you have money, power, compete, get to the top. So we have to find uh, ways of getting young people to you know, and in the end, this is Ahimsa. You know, Ahimsa is not just, a, you know, self-disciplining in a very monkish kind of way. But Ahimsa is also joy, is also sisterhood and brotherhood. And I keep saying there are two ways of looking at life. One is vertical, where you're a climber, you want to get to the top. Or the other way, which is Gandhi's way, which is horizontal, where you are connected with other human beings. You're not just climbing like this. And when you're horizontal, you're also close to the earth. You're connected with the earth. You know, you, 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 you care for the earth and the earth is part of you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Rajni. It's yeah. so enriching.